I think there's an element of working the refs here, Alex. You know, there are uh, building owners who definitely don't want to pay more because they might have been getting a really good deal under Barrios, and they will point to a whole bunch of reasons as to why not to change assessments from the way things were done in Barrios. And I think we all need to evaluate the, those arguments critically. It all goes back to market value. If you're not going to assess a building based on market value, what on earth are you supposed to assess it on? And remember that when you do that, it comes at the expense of someone else. Hello, welcome to the Clubcast. I'm Alex Nitkin. I'll be your host this week. Fritz Kagey swept into office as Cook County Assessor in 2018 to reform what he called a broken property tax assessment system that was giving discounts to expensive properties and well-connected property owners and leaving everyone else to pick up the tab. He's now running for re-election after a tumultuous three years, overhauling the way that the county decides how much properties are worth so it knows how much to tax them. Not everyone thinks that that overhaul has been for the better. Kagi has been really heavily shifting more tax burden back onto businesses and office owners in a way that those industries say is just not sustainable for them. And he is asking property owners for all kinds of new information about rent and income that his predecessor, Joe Barrios, Never did. And through all the changes, the refrain that Kagi keeps coming back to is, hey, we're just following the market. We're just taking the temperature. We're not making weather. So what you're about to hear is an extended explanation of how Kagi does that, what his methodology is, and why he thinks that that system should prevail over the way that properties are assessed for another four years, even as he faces a lot of blowback, including from a formidable new primary challenger. So here is our conversation, which was recorded last Monday, the 22nd. Assessor Fritz Kagey, thank you so much for coming on the Cloudcast. How are you? Hey, good to see you, Alex. Thanks for having me again. Of course. So I want to start things off with just a little bit of a kind of schoolhouse rock rundown on what the assessor's office does, because when you are campaigning, I imagine, you know, at a parade or a retirement home or what have you, and someone says, or you say, I'm Fritz Kagey, I'm running for assessor, you must get a lot of, what the heck is an assessor? Why should I care about that? Um <laughs> So in that moment, what is your condensed little pitch for, here's what the assessor does, here's why it's an important office that you should care about, and here's why I'm the guy for the job? Sure. Um, you know, with the way I talk about it is that the assessor's office is sort of the fairness or equity side of the overall property tax system. So what the assessor's office doesn't do is determine how much money uh, our government needs to raise in property taxes. That's determined by, largely by school boards but also by our local villages and municipalities. And that's one stream, and they determine how much money has to be raised from property owners. Where assessments come in is we don't do it because they're fun, but because this is how we divide up that amount of money that has to be raised proportionally amongst all the property owners in a place. Um, and assessments are really, we use market value as the standard under the law for deciding how we divide up that burden that's determined by others amongst all of us. And it's really important that how we do this is uh, a standard that's, you know, we're using market values for everyone so that there's not a favor conferred on, um, at the, on some at the expense of others. And that's why it's really about equity and fairness. What you want out of an assessor is making sure that we're taking an accurate picture of market values, no matter who you are, where you live, what you own. Um, and we're doing it without bias, and we're doing it transparently using the best resources uh, and tools that are out there. You have really tried to communicate a lot about how your office is changing that practice from Joe Barrios, who was there before, who you unseated in 2018. Um, and there has been a lot made, I guess, of just the different kinds of math that are used to bring about that assessment value to help, you know, create that input for how much we're all paying in our property taxes. Um, so could you just run us through how that practice is now different? What inputs are going into making that calculation that were not there or are different from before you took office? Yeah, I, I, I'd frame it a little bit differently. It's about taking an accurate picture of the market that's out there for every kind of building, for every kind of asset, no matter where, where they are. Um, and taking that accurate snapshot um, you do it with the best data that you have, and you and you put yourself in the foot of uh, a market participant to to do this right. So in the case of homes, we're lucky. We have lots of transactions that are out there. We have the characteristics of homes. Homes are relatively uh, homogeneous, so um, we can use mass models in a lot of cases for that. They don't always work well, but most of the time they do. Um, and then in the case of commercial properties, commercial properties have many fewer transactions. They're much more diverse. Think of the difference between an office building, a bowling alley, a data center, 
a lab, and a, an apartment tower or office tower. These are all really different. Um, they move to different drummers, um, but usually what unites them is in the commercial market, market participants value them based on the income that they're expected to generate, and then what kind of multiple a, a market participant might put on the annual income to come up with the market value. And it's our job, our, our, all participants in the assessment system, to take that snapshot accurately, and then we're all accountable for making sure that the assessments that we do come up with actually are in line with the real prices that are being paid out there. And if we're not, we adjust. We try to see what are we doing? What data are we missing? Is there something in our methods? Um, and it's an iterative process. And so uh, really what we focused in on, Alex, since um, you know the Barrios administration is, first of all, making sure that we're addressing the biggest disparities in, in valuation. So third-party studies had shown that the very biggest disparity was in the valuation of the largest buildings seemed to have the greatest undervaluation. And then smaller commercial properties seem to be valued closer to the line. So that was regressive um, on commercial. And then within residential, there was also this pattern of regressivity where higher end residential properties seem to have a tendency to be undervalued and the lowest end properties seem to have a tendency to be overvalued. And that was another thing that required correction. And Sometimes, you know, the, the objective reality of what these things are trading for is pretty clear. The key is to make sure that our methods and our models are eliminating those biases and disparities. And, you know, as I've mentioned several times, that's really been the focus of our administration to address all these different kinds of disparities and shortfalls in valuation, but also addressing overassessment too. And then using all the different tools to make sure we're doing that right. And then to measure ourselves to make sure that we're getting there. And we want to be, do this transparently because we think it's important for people to see the process. There was um, a lot of criticism in what you, you based your campaign on uh, was, you know, in part because of a Tribune investigation that found a lot of the biggest, most expensive and extravagant properties downtown were being underassessed. Uh, what is the implication of now those being brought, you're bringing those values way up closer to what you're saying their their sell prices are. What does that mean for, for everyone else? Sure. I, I think because that was the greatest disparity in our assessment system, you know, that, that IAAO study showed there was a 40% shortfall in overall commercial valuations you know, on the eve of us taking office. And actually it was even bigger in the city of Chicago itself. Um, even after the effect of COVID, the, the property tax base is is looking differently after we're reassessing Chicago this year. So we've re we sent out uh, the first stage of reassessments in most of the city so far. We're, I think we're 90% done. Um, uh, and that shows that our property tax base is up about 50% um, so far in the city of Chicago. And some of the biggest buildings downtown, you know, we've published, you know, people can go out and see how much the values have changed. You know, a lot of the biggest buildings downtown we found to be uh, you know, in line with that undervaluation that the IAAO found, around 50%. So a lot of their assessments rose pretty significantly, even after taking into account the effect of COVID. What that means is that their values now are aligned with market values, just as most other properties already have been. Um, and that reduces uh, small businesses and homeowners' share of the overall burden from where it was before. That's the biggest upshot um, from from this. And Cranes recently did a real deep dive looking at our revaluation of downtown Chicago. They looked at some of the most powerful, use, they use some of the most powerful valuation tools, which are, uh, they look inside appraisals that are a part of commercial mortgage-backed securities. And these are appraisals issued by the building owners themselves and what they report to the SEC. And the Cranes investigation showed that for a multitude of, of, of big buildings, the biggest buildings downtown, that the values were not only in, you know, in line with the market, but actually could said to be conservative. Um, and, you know, we think that that is a, uh, a fair reflection of, of the assessments that we came up with, because we are taking into account the effect of COVID and the challenges of that, that, you know, came subsequent to those appraisals that, uh, that, that uh, Cranes looked at when they did that deep dive. So you've been in this role for three years now. You've been assessor. That is one full reassessment cycle. Your office has now done reassessments or is about to wrap up doing reassessments on 
every corner of the county. Um, I think it's no secret there are a lot of folks out there who are not your biggest fan through this whole process, including, you know, and especially a lot of those owners of downtown buildings, commercial real estate buildings, who say that when those assessments are going up, you know, people have to understand there are a lot of businesses in there, including small businesses, and even if they're not small businesses, vulnerable businesses that have taken a huge hit from COVID, not, you know, not just retail, but also office landlords, now that everyone's working from home. They're saying that a lot of businesses are, are now forced to go out of business with these sky high property taxes and rents, and no small part because of this practice, you know, originating in your office of sort of shifting that burden, the tax burden more from homeowners to businesses. So as you gear up for re-election here, um, how do you counter that that narrative that the assessor's office, that your office could be part of the reason why, you know, some businesses cannot cope with these expenses? Well, I, I do think, uh, you know, market participants, including people who are some of the biggest commercial uh, building owners, they don't dispute that the valuations that we're using are reflecting the market values. I think what they do, you know, what they do dispute is that their buildings should be valued in line with the market. I think some don't accept that premise. Um, and, you know, what I remind them is that this is the law. The law is that um, we as analysts and valuation experts, at the assessor's office, where the Illinois property tax code says, all properties in the state are to be valued in, uh, according to fair market value. Um, and that's what we're doing. And there's really, I don't see any viable alternative to, to doing that and having a, a functional system that's, you know, where you're having a real professionals, valuation professionals, value properties. If you're not using market, what are you using? Because if once you deviate from that, you confer a favor on someone at the expense of every at the expense of everyone else, and I, I'd add that that if we are undervaluing the very biggest buildings, you are putting additional burden on small business, and that's what that IAAO study showed. The IAAO study showed that the smaller your per commercial property gets, the more those commercial properties were picking up the tab for the biggest buildings, especially the ones out in the neighborhoods. If you look in the northwest or Southwest sides. And so what we've really tried to remind everyone is that our guide is to identify what the market values for these properties are. Most people will benefit from uh, that being done, including small businesses. And we have a differentiated view. We really try to differentiate between the market conditions that affect a small property um, and a big one. Uh, because they are different markets. They are different asset classes. Uh, investors pay different multiples for a small class C office building in a neighborhood versus a class A office building downtown. They pay a different value for a class C multi-story warehouse that's 100 years old in McKinley Park versus a new class A warehouse down in Pullman. Um, and we really have tried, uh, really bent over backwards to uh, build into our process the data that differentiates the different circumstances for these different kinds of assets and also um, methods. Um, and how have we done that? We've invested in subscribing to pretty much every commercial uh, data <laughs> provider that is available on the market. And the county has been really terrific in supporting us in doing that from the get-go. We have brought in, we've really beefed up our uh, commercial valuation team in terms of people to uh, have a differentiated closer look at smaller versus bigger. I know when I talk to my valuation team, I ask them to tell me not only how are you valuing properties on the baseline, but how are you thinking about how we account for different valuation uh, levels for smaller properties that are out in the neighborhoods that are lower down on the quality spectrum. We've, uh, sent, we've created a process called the Real Property Income and Expense Form. So those small properties can report to us before we send out the assessments, the special circumstances that they have. And of course, as you know, we've tried to work hard to create a, a data collection framework down in Springfield that also helps us differentiate uh, the different data for the small versus big properties. But the biggest thing that we can do for every property owner, including the smallest uh, property owners is to reduce the disparities in the valuations. Regressivity uh, in assessments hurts the small business out in the neighborhood just the way it does um, the small uh, homeowner. So these all, all of these are connected and we've really tried hard to 
to get all that right now. Except I, there's one other thing I'd like to add is we are seeing pretty ro- a pretty robust investment environment um, out there now across a bunch of different asset classes. Um, you know, Cranes just reported that uh, the apartment building boom is back. Cranes are turning. Capital's flowing. Uh, people can go and um, check that story out. The, the apartment business is is quite healthy in terms for of construction and all the other fundamentals. If you look at the industrial, uh, it's the same cold storage, uh, lab space. Um, in other words, you're saying that all of the commercial real estate folks who were saying, you know, Kage's assessments are going to run us all out of town and it's going to be the death of our industry. You're saying that um, that's not happening now. Well, I think there's an element of working the refs here, Alex, um, that, uh, you know, there are uh, building owners who definitely don't want to pay more because they might have been getting a really good deal under Barrios, and they will point to a whole bunch of reasons as to why not to change assessments from the way things were done in Barrios. And I think we all need to evaluate the, those arguments critically. It all goes back to market value. And if, if you're not going to assess a building based on market value, what on earth are you supposed to assess it on? And remember that when you do that, it comes at the expense of someone else. If the assessment system was distorted, you know, that homeowners and small businesses had to pick up the tab for the big buildings, I think that's the kind of thing where small business was hurt by a distortion in our assessment system that we're trying to address. And so I always try to remember what's going on for the average person, the average small business is the other side when big building owners say that, you know, we, it's not fair to value us in line with market like everyone else. Let's dig a little bit more into that concept of capturing market value. And I want to get a a little bit into the the weeds on this because you have talked about measuring things like income and how well a property is performing. Um, There are property tax attorneys, uh, commercial real estate owners who out there say, um, that's not what you're supposed to be doing necessarily. The whole idea is that you are taking a structure and then irrespective of whatever fluid factors may be happening in the moment, you just assess the building. Um, they say that you're kind of throwing that off kilter by trying to capture all of this other more short-term information about how much money they're making or how much rent they're collecting on a, in a given time. Why is that an appropriate input to be adding in there? Well, I'd actually flip it around um, because uh, if you go if you go and look at just every, I invite everyone to go and take a look at our valuation report on commercial property in the South um, South Township, which is the Loop of Chicago, um, and you can go and see what's the dollar per square foot that we're assessing office space at, and you can see there's a pretty tight range. Uh, we're on on uh, a office space. You know, we list what's the dollar per square foot that we're valuing uh, the largest office buildings at, and you can see as you go down the quality spectrum how that changes. And that's based on actual transactions that have happened. It's also based on um, the capital markets. So when we're seeing office buildings refinance themselves through the bond market, they have to file an appraisal that goes with that refinancing. And there are people out there with real money on the line. um, And these are values that are represented to the SEC on what these buildings are actually worth. And that's how they're valuing the collateral. So those capital markets are another great indicator besides actual transactions. And we look at that so that we can understand, hey, here's how the market's thinking about what an expected stream of income is from a building like this and then what is the multiple that the market's willing to attribute to that and then when we have those indicators we can uniformly apply it to all different buildings regardless of what the different structure of leases that they have are and i think that's what you're talking about with property tax attorneys and building owners saying hey a lease that i signed two years ago might be real different from a lease that i could sign now it's not fair to value me on leases that are no longer at market levels. Um, and we say, you know, yes, we want to look at market transactions to see where the market is paying for what multiples of income the market is willing to pay for. And then we can recalibrate where income is based on where the market is today with those multiples that have been established in the market. We can look at what is the expected occupancy that's built into these market transactions. So we try to look at them from a top down view. How much is the market paying per dollar of square foot, but we also try to look at it from the bottom up, looking at the, you know, the different drivers of value. Um, and we do it uniformly. I think the, you know, the good point is that ultimately, you know, we can test uh, valuation 
with transactions, right? And then we can disaggregate in transactions the different assumptions that are built in. And this is why doing a good job collecting data is so important because there are not enough transactions. So extracting meaningful data from the transactions that do happen and then extracting data from the capital markets activity that's taking out place out there besides the the straight transactions, those are those are really good building blocks. Those are the best building blocks that I'm aware of for valuation. If we don't do that, what do we value them? In other words, to look at a building that actually sold, say, hey, this sold for $200,000. And so when we valued it at $220,000 or $180,000, that was pretty close because that's the, the benchmark that you're going on. Well, yes. And you can actually go a step further. If, some, if a building sold for $200,000, and the cap rate implied in that transaction was 6%, to us, that 6% is the real meaningful number. Because then if rents are changing, if you know market rents are changing, but the cap rates are still saying, you know, staying in line with that 6%. And we see this in apartment buildings, right? The apartment transactions, there are a lot of transactions in the fives and the sixes. Then we can say, okay, well, we got we can hang our hat on on valuations in the fives and the sixes and then see where rents are see where the other drivers of of value are i'll give you a good example from the hotel industry you know hotels have very volatile income um especially in a time like this where we have uh the pandemic it's it's really caused mayhem um in the hospitality industry but when we're seeing transactions in hotels we can look at the dollars per key the amount of dollars being paid per room in hotels, and that's a pretty good metric of value. And you know, the hotel transactions that have taken pretty that have taken place this year have been, again, we've been pretty in line, actually, pretty conservative on our hotel valuations. Just to pause real quick to go back and to define a term not everyone may be aware of: cap rates, capitalization rates, basically a yes. way of measuring a, a property's sort of investment worthiness and, and value. If it's a lower cap rate, then it's a higher value right. building generally. Um, the other sort of flip side of taking in and measure into consideration um, the income and market fluctuations that are happening is that vacant businesses are going to get lower assessments, just as a general rule, right? Um, there have been some businesses, chambers of commerce that also don't look kindly on that. Block Club has reported on businesses in South Shore that think that the assessor's office has been giving um, you know, has been assessing too low, has been giving too big breaks to businesses that are vacant and that that is actually disincentivizing them from hunting down new businesses. Is that a concern in your office? Well, yeah, it was a concern at our office and it was a concern about the previous administration. And that's why we changed uh, the vacancy policy. Um, and because we got this great feedback from uh, from neighborhood chambers, from uh, people who are entrepreneurs who are who are you know running businesses in corridors like 71st Street and South Shore and Clark Street and Lincoln Park and the Six Corners up in the Northwest Side. So this is one of the things that we identified during our transition. Um, and so in 2020, we changed the vacancy policy of this office. Previously, the the policy had been if a if a space is uh, 100% vacant, you could get up to a 90% reduction in your assessed value. Um, even though in the market, if you kept a, a property 100% vacant, its value would not fall 90%. It might fall 30, 40, but a reasonable buyer would assume that this building would still have earning power in the future, that they could reasonably occupy it. Uh, so what we did is we changed the policy. Uh, and, and by the way, that, that vacancy as Block Club uh, identified, you know, the vacancy policy in the past was harmful because it, re it it, it incentivized people keeping space empty. Um, there was an investment strategy that appeared to arise where people would buy a property, keep it vacant, keep their carrying costs low, and then expect to earn a return on the underlying appreciation of value in the land later on. Um, and stashing properties like that really hurt neighboring businesses that were staying open in good faith. It hurt foot traffic, hurt sales tax collection. So it forced the whole system to lean more heavily on property taxes. And of course, it hurt neighborhood vitality and employment. So for a bunch of reasons, it was bad. Um, what we did is our new vacancy policy uh, gives credit for commercial properties in a class on a corridor for the neighborhood level uh, vacancy rate, whether the property is 100% vacant or not. Because even if you have 100% 
occupied space, a reasonable buyer is going to build in an expectation of some vacancy. Um, that's a, a, a prudent margin of safety that a buyer would take. And similarly, if a space is empty, a buyer could ex still expect to earn income from it and not leave money on the table. So what we do is we give credit for every uh, property on a corridor for the neighborhood vacancy rate. And if someone claims additional vacancy, they get credit for a fraction of the additional amount of vacancy temporarily, just for a couple of years. Um, and what we're hearing from uh, people out in the neighborhoods, like Alderman Michelle Smith has mentioned this to us, is this is helping to reactivate space that was staying vacant, and it's starting to put space to work. You mentioned a, a little bit earlier on that when assessments broadly go up for the highest end businesses, for the Sears Towers, for a lot of those downtown skyscrapers, that works out for the vast majority of residents, that they're going to see a benefit from that. We hear this kind of suspicion from commercial real estate world that your office's practice of ultimately shifting that tax burden from owners, homeowners to businesses is this sort of like deliberate political calculation to try to curry more favor from the greater majority of voters out there who are homeowners as opposed to business owners. I don't know, that would probably be a pretty effective political strategy, right? If you wanted to be really cynical about it. Well, the, the thing is, is that following the market happens to be the right thing to do for, for people. And so we're faithfully following the market. We're following the law. We're following where the data leads us. And that's why the story that Cranes did was, was so important, because it took a deep dive with the most you know, powerful valuation tools that are out there, um, and, you know, the C, uh, appraisals from the CMBS market. And it looked at our reassessment of downtown Chicago, all these big buildings, which have, you know, the, the eyes of the capital markets on them. These are, you know, really, you know, solid appraisals, so very solid data. And they found that our assessments were not only, you know, in line with market and improvement from where they were before, but could actually be said to be conservative. That's sort of the, the validation that I think will continue, keep continuing to come and it, you know, it's a culmination of three years worth of work because this was the greatest disparity that the data pointed to, that when you're seeing big buildings, identifiable buildings downtown that have transacted for way more than they were assessed at before, someone else is making up the difference. And fixing that is the most important task for uh, an assessment system. And, and so um, people object to having to pay more, having their assessment go up, that that does not feel good. But I don't see people disputing, you know, the valuation marks that we're using in terms of being accurate, uh, more in line with the market. You mentioned that n about 90% of all assessment notices have gone out in the city of Chicago, which is undergoing reassessment right now. Um, that is very late compared to a typical year. Usually by this time, the assessor's office would be almost wrapped up, not just on those original assessment notices, but on, on the appeals decisions and be ready to ship them all off to the Board of Review for the next step. For all the municipalities and school districts and you know other taxing bodies out there who rely on getting their property taxes in on time to balance their budgets and are really looking at this and worried about a sort of chain reaction initiated by you that could leave them holding the bag for lost revenue, um, is that not also you know, not just a practical, but a, a political concern for you as you try to mount a re-election campaign? I, I really think the, the public, the county cares most about modernizing um, all aspects of our property tax system. And by the way, not just the assessor's office. So the county really looked at this huge problem that it had. And they did this back in 2015. The IT systems that the county property tax bodies are using date back to the 80s, back when I was playing Pac-Man and Space Invaders as a kid, okay? And I kid you not, those are the systems that are at the heart of our property tax system. And they saw this as a huge threat in a number of ways. First of all, the people who know how to program in these languages are all getting old. There are only a handful of people who know how to program on these systems anymore. We had to bring back one of them from retirement. You know, Increasingly, there's a danger that we don't know what the code does. And so the counties looked at it every which way from Sunday, and they said, "There's we need to adopt a system that allows systems to talk to each other, that is, is, is delivering services, in line with what people deserve in the 20th century that our peers get in the rest of the country. And the county um, said that, you know, when it comes to assessment systems, that, you know, the Tyler system is really the only alternative to do. So they signed a contract in 2015, they paid money for it, 
And then, you know, our predecessor didn't do anything to implement it because it was hard. We had to initiate the change, um, but we knew that the risk is growing every year, that these guys who can program this are retirement maintenance costs are through the roof. Um, and we need to do this. You know, we, we've seen since we've come into office, the shortcomings of that old rickety system that was in place where the, the risk is rising. And we think the public really wants that modernization. So we, we bit the bullet last year and we put in the first phase of the county's uh, property tax system by putting in place online appeals. And that really helped us. That helped the public. So they, we got hundreds of over 100,000 appeals coming in online versus on paper right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, that's an example of already reaping gains from this. And this year we went live on the whole first phase of the, the assessment system, the building permits, the data, our valuations, incorporating uh, building characteristics and changes. And we went live on that, which is a huge achievement. Now, the problem is it was unavoidable that this would create a delay. But if we didn't do it this year, kicking the can down the, the road for the next year would just put us in a deeper hole with more risk, more cost. And it's important for us to take this on so that the other county offices can start their phase of this modernization too. So it came to us, you know, we did it. it. You know, it caused us to be a couple months behind, but we think we're delivering on the county's priority of getting this package going, kicking it off, getting it started. And we're delivering better services for the public. This is you know, part and parcel of modernization, modernization of the assessment system. It's not okay to have at the beating heart this system that, that dates back to the early Heinz administration. So your bet then is that people will understand that to the point that they will think that that outweighs a delay? or We, we, think, we think the public, to the extent that they care about um, you know, our, the, the workings of our IT modernizations, they want the system modernized. They want better services. They, they, they think that, you know, I think a lot of the distrust of the office has to do with antiquated systems. It doesn't build faith um, in people when they're seeing lots of paper forms being circulated around. We are getting exemption applications coming in from the township assessors via fax. So that's why it needs to be replaced. We think that's what the public cares about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kerry Steele, who is the president of the Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago Board, announced a challenge against you. She's going to run for assessor next year. She said in her campaign video that you have been long on promises, short on action that you've delivered, including that you promised to be a competent manager. And then she pointed to uh, the Sun-Times investigation of errors in the senior freeze program. Um, I And I know that your office has, has said that you've since worked that out, but you know, between that, delays in property taxes, you know, criticism that you got, I know, over the COVID readjustment to the uh, property tax assessments originally that went out last year that led to, you know, another series of delays. Are, are you concerned that those could sort of build into an argument of your office has been making mistakes, that that competence uh, uh, criticism might land? We, we have a really terrific result to point to. First of all, this was the first year that, uh, you know, let's look at results and what, what what's in people's property tax bills. This was the first year that the median residential property tax bill fell in the city of Chicago for close to a decade. In Cook County, residential property tax bills up just 1% for the second straight year. And, you know, both of this, both of these things are identifiable and we've had a meaningful impact because of what Cranes calls the Kagi effect which is making sure that the biggest properties, just because we're making sure that they're valued in line with the market, that we've reduced and we've changed artificially low valuations to be in line with the market, just like everyone else, that that's making a meaningful difference in the property tax bills people paid. We really stopped the trend that had been going on for decades where residential property tax bills rose faster than commercial. And we're really proud of that impact. We've been getting awards when this office never got awards before. The National Association of Counties recognized our digital tools that we put in place, that online appeal system, um, as, uh, as, as something that's really worthy of commendation. The National Association of Counties is a, is a very big organization, the gold standard in the public administration of counties across the U.S., and they recognized our work. I think we're the only assessor's office to get that recognition for the digital tools that we put into place. And that is hard work. We got recognition from the International Association of Assessing Officers for our transparency and in public information. Um, again, not something that this office was 
known before. We've become a national leader in the U.S. for the data science that we're putting to work in reducing some of the disparities that were there before um, and getting that recognition. I'm the first assessor not to take campaign contributions from lawyers and appraisers who practice before us. This is part of the huge eth ethical transformation um, of our office. People really like the idea that um, uh, our analysts don't see the identity of the lawyers uh, making commercial property appeals um, anymore. We've had great accomplishments in Springfield, uh, passage of automatic renewal of the senior exemption, this year, passage of the Omnibus Affordable Housing Bill, which is incentivizing the construction of affordable rental housing that we will be implementing. And we worked very closely with the bill sponsors on, you know, Sarah Feigenholz, the sponsor of the Affordable Housing Bill, endorsing my campaign. So we've got so many great things that we can point to. And of course, the IAAO sales ratio study, which just came out, it shows that our assessments for, are in line with industry standards. And that first area that we reassessed for equity, uniformity, and uh, accuracy for the first time ever. So this is what, you know, this is what assessments come down to. It's making a big difference in people's pocketbooks and people can see the change there. And we think people will want a lot more of that, that we're going in the right direction. And I think the public knows that reforming and modernizing an office like mine is, is not a walk on the beach. I think people uh, know when we're taking criticism from the big building owners that I take those hits so that the average homeowner or small business doesn't have to. Um, and that uh, it's probably not a good idea to go back to a lot of those old practices which dogged the system before and caused so much hardship. You mentioned ethics. Let's talk about Shackman. Uh, the assistant's office has been under a federal hiring monitor since 2012 to try and weed out, you know, quote based hiring, politically motivated hiring. At first, it seemed like your office was on track to reach what's called substantial compliance to, to break free of this you know, really expensive and time-consuming federal oversight by the end of this year. Um, but the court-appointed monitor, Sue Fibus, wrote in a report last month, you know, we might have to push that back a little bit. It doesn't look like your office is quite ready. Now, you know, maybe February is what we aim for. How important is it that you reach that substantial compliance, break free of that monitor, you know, before you come to ask voters to, to reelect you? Well, uh, first of all, we don't we don't use the term break free because this is all about achieving substantial compliance um, and, and a durable remedy that will be in place uh, forever um, so that you know we can demonstrate that we don't have uh, um, UP, UPD, which is a term from the Shackman Monitor. Unlawful which is political discrimination. Unlawful political discrimination. That's right. And um, we have made so much progress towards Shackman compliance. So we're doing personnel evaluations when we never did this before. We put in all the place, all the rules in place in terms of a new handbook. We are um, hiring in line with this, but there are lots of things where we have to uh, satisfy the monitor and the judge on all the different aspects of this after a durable period of monitoring. Um, and our, we, we created a new deputy of HR to elevate the importance of compliance with um, these rules to really focus in on and drill down on making sure that all of our HR procedures are what uh, the monitor and the judge and the plaintiff's counsel wants to see. Now, our the head of our HR, she had a baby, and so um, and we've had to get a new compliance officer because it's a hot job market. So that set us back a couple months. We're on the right path. We believe we're on the right path, and uh, we're confident that we will be able to achieve substantial compliance because there's not been a, a scintilla of, of uh, political di discrimination that they can find since we've been in office. And it's a matter of demonstrating that we have all the durable remedies in place for the future. And though we don't think about it as breaking free, that's really a key uh, thing for us to demonstrate. Broadening that out a little bit, you came into the assessor's office on a promise of really breaking apart that culture of a uh, clout-based you could call it kind of an old boys network that benefited well-connected property owners at everyone else's expense and sort of opening it up more um, of being, you know, a reformer, improving transparency. I wonder if you could speak to, you know, you were getting into this a little bit more, just talking about ac accomplishments generally, but specific on that, um, you know, ethics uh, and transparency front. What kind of progress you think your office has made and, and what work really still needs to be done? We think the progress that we've made is really excellent, that we're giving uh, people a different look and the rubber is hitting the road in a very different way than it did before. You know, it started with people bringing in together assessment professionals from and other professionals from around the U.S. So our chief valuations officer 
was the you know was the chief assessing officer in Lake County. Um, we brought in assessment professionals from other parts of the country, like Philadelphia and LA, DuPage County, people who are highly respected professionals. We brought in people who are uh, have a great experience in the private sector, uh, working for banks, working for accounting firms and valuation firms. So that's that's the first step. We put in place a very strict ethics code that uh, extends my promise not to take campaign contributions from the lawyers and appraisers who practice before us. I'm the very first assessor uh, to make and to keep that pledge. Uh, we have thousands of people who support my campaign uh, who are motivated by issues of good government and equity. And we've really demonstrated that we can sustain and, and have a support base that, that pushes the office in that direction. Uh, all the things that we've done on transparency, putting our models online, putting all the valuation drivers that we use um, there and being accountable for them. Um, that is a complete transformation from where this office before. I think we've shown we're, that we're not a black box anymore, that people can see the drivers that we're using in our valuations. They may disagree with them, and we make sure that we walk humbly um, so that you know we're about 230 people valuing close to 2 million properties. We can get this wrong sometimes, especially if we don't get the right data. Um, you know, We think that that move on, on transparency goes part and parcel with the ethical transformation of the office. Having anonymous commercial appeals is an important part of that. Having a visitor's log, putting all this information and data online for people to see and opening it up. And you know, part of the new, the, the Tyler system that we put into place, it's gonna create more transparency tools. People will be able to look inside our commercial models without having to FOIA them. We'll be able to put that out publicly, it's going to deliver a stream of other benefits that we think moves and, and, and really institutionalizes the culture of, of transparency, accountability uh, in the office for the future. That's very important to us. There has been some very real and pretty public tension between your office and the Board of Review. Um, on the one hand, that's probably somewhat healthy, right? Because they're meant to, to be a sort of a check on your office. But um, we've really seen your office and the Board of Review come to some really substantial, you know, disagreements about just fundamentally how you are getting at uh, um, assessments and property valuations. And I'm sure that there's a lot that you could say here today to sort of litigate that. But I want to ask about this sort of from a political perspective, because all three Board of Review commissioners are going to be up for re-election next year after the the uh, redistricting, right? So do you see that as an opportunity? Are you going to, you know, run on a ticket with Board of Review candidates, or are you just going to not touch those races with a ten foot pole? Well, thanks for asking. Actually, I already established my my policy on this last cycle. I had an employee and a, a dear friend who ran for uh, Board Review, and uh, this is Abdul Nasser Rashid. Yes, and he wasn't mm -hmm. able to continue to work with me once he started running, and I. I didn't endorse, I didn't involve in support. And I think that's a good policy for the assessor uh, to adopt because the board review is a, it's an independent body that provides a second look at the assessments that uh, we have done. We go and practice and argue before the board review on behalf of our assessments. Um, and uh, it's, it's a conflict for the assessor to be out there trying to um, you know, tilt the playing field in terms of who um, who occupy those positions. We think it's it's healthier for the whole system for them to be independent. You're right. There's a national there's a natural institutional tension between us and the board review in terms of you know where assessments are landing. We think it's important to keep the arguments, any arguments or disagreements that we have, focused on data and methods and where assessments are landing versus market values. And you know. You'll, Notice in my comments, I pretty consistently focus on on that. That this is about, um, you know, if we have a difference in valuation opinions, we think it's important for us to lay out, you know, why we might have a difference of opinion. What are the what explains the difference of opinion? And I think that's healthy. You know, that's a healthy uh, evergreen policy for the assessor's office to have going forward. So just to make it clear, I'm not involved in any or supporting any uh, folks running for board of review. How about for other county offices? You know. Um, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle has said that she will endorse all of the countywide incumbents, yourself included, for re-election. Um, are you going to return the favor? Are you going to endorse her? Is that going to extend to you know Sheriff Tom Dart, Treasurer Maria Pappas, any of those folks? Oh, y yes. Uh, actually, uh, Tony Preckwinkle, she announced uh, her slate of endorsements uh, last week, and I was one of them. Um, so 
I support her as county president. I think she's the best county president we've ever had. Um, and it's a great record. And we do good work with her. You know, the we are implementing the county's um, integrated property tax system. So we're in the trenches with her Bureau of Technology every day. She and the Board of Commissioners have been terrific in supporting us with subscribing and building up our data resources and in renewing uh, uh, our staff, uh, refreshing the, the staffing that we have. So our official relationship is good. And, um, you know, as someone who's running on the slate, I'd support the other countywide elected officials. How about commissioners, district commissioners? On the county board? Right. Will you make yes. endorsements? So I, Are you planning yeah, I, I will. I will. I will make uh, some endorsements. Uh, depends on, I, you know, uh, depends on, you know, whether the race is open, whether I know the person or not. But I'll, I'll generally fall in line with. You know, I will. You know, uh, as someone who's part of the seeking some the party slate, I'd support the other county uh, commissioner candidates in line with the with the party. Any you want to announce right now? Well, um, you know, I know uh, Bernard Alsberry very well. I think he's a he's a terrific person who's running uh, to replace uh, Deborah Sims. Um, but we've got a very strong county board. Uh, we really love working with uh, the commissioners who are running up there. I support Josina Morita. I think she'll be a terrific addition. Running, running for, for the seat. Sorry to cut you off. Vacated by Larry Sufferton in the north suburbs in the. 15th that, that's century. right. That's right. Um, and uh, you know the our. This county board is very strong. We love the group of skills that they have, and it's a pleasure to work with them. Fritz Kagey is the Cook County Assessor. He is running for re-election for another four years. He will be on next year's June primary ballot. Thanks so much for coming on the Cloudcast. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for inviting me, Alex. Good to have all the listeners out there. I look forward to it again. Thanks again to Assessor Kagey for taking so much time to speak with us. We posted links in the bio to the deep dive into downtown assessments that he brought up a few times that was done by Alby Gallen over at Cranes, as well as the sales ratio study of 2019 assessments from the IAAO, that's the International Association of Assessing Officers. I also want to note we did reach out to Commissioner Carrie Steele's team to have her on the Cloudcast as well. We were not quite able to make the timing work this time, but we hope to have her on soon. This episode of the Cloudcast was produced and edited by me, Alex Nitkin. We'll be back with another episode in two weeks.